Hi, my name is Tobias Knapp. I'm a computer scientist from Hamburg in Germany. And in today's talk, I want to, uh, re want to present our tomographic image reconstruction pipeline that we developed in Julia. So let's get started. So we will today talk about tomography and I first want to give you a short introduction into what tomography actually is. Have a look at this apple here. And sometimes you want to have a look inside the apple before you eat it. For instance, you might fear that there is some warm in it. And in that uh, case, you want to look inside of it. And there are different ways to do it. And the easiest way is certainly to cut the apple and look at the slice within the apple. And here you can see that the apple is fine and you can just eat it. And if you now transfer this to humans, you directly see the problem. Because if you think this is a human and you slice a healthy human, just to find out that the human is okay, you of course have a problem because after slicing, he is not healthy anymore. And um, tomography is basically a method which allows us to look inside the apple without slicing it. And as you can imagine, these techniques that allow this look inside objects without actually cutting them have revolutionized the medical diagnosis and orthotherapy. And um, they allow to make a diagnosis much earlier and to even find smaller diseases um, before they actually lead to severe illness. So how does this work? And the most important point here is that in tomography, we want to have a look inside the object and inside the object, we have some function we want to de determine. In, or in order to do that, we need to transport the information from the function inside the object into the outside. And this is the key element in tomography. And then as, as an example, you can here see the computer tomography principle. In computer tomography, you have some X-ray source and an X-ray beam goes through the object, which we represent here by the attenuation co coefficient mu of XY. And at the X-ray detector, the outside, we are detecting a signal P of Xi. And if we now rotate the ender setup, this allows us, after inversion of a certain problem, to determine the mu of xy in an image reconstruction step. And this is what we will talk about today. This is how it looked actually in practice. Here you can see an open computer tomograph and you directly see that there's quite some engineering going on to actually build something like this. Here's a selection of um, imaging modalities that are widely used in the clinics today. We have computer tomography, we have magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, we have sonography or ultrasound. And in my research group, we are developing a new method called magnetic particle imaging. More on that later. Then there are more, more imaging modalities like, for instance, positron emission tomography and optical coherence tomography. So one question is, why do we have actually such a variety of methods? And the reason is that they're all vary in contrast in the spatial re resolution that they offer, the temporal resolution and the sens sensitivity. So each of these methods has its pros and cons and is thus used in the clinical routine. Fortunately, from a mathematical point of view, all these methods can be written in a similar form as a linear system of equations. So in the core, they all have some equation S times C equal to U, where S is the system matrix that describes the physics. C is the unknowns. This is the underlying image, which can be 2D, 3D or 4D if we think about some time-resolved image. U are the measurements. This is what we measure from the outside. And N is the noise. Most importantly here to note is that the system matrix S is usually so large that we cannot explicitly set it up and store it in the main memory of a computer. Think of something like M equals to N equal to 512 um, to the power of three. So Im image reconstruction now involves solving such a linear system. And this linear system usually is of a large scale. It is ill posed. It is noisy. In many cases, cases the um, linear system is also under, uh, under, under um, determined, which can re um, result um, in, because of an undersampling. Because in practice, of, we want to measure um, only few points in order to achieve a high temporal resolution, and this effectively leads to undersampled data. 
in a generic form, most modern reconstruction methods look something like this. We have an optimization problem where we want to minimize this functional. We have in the first part, the so-called data discrepancy term, where we have S times C minus U in the L2 norm, and we aim to minimize this. So in other words, we want to match our model S times C to the data U. In addition, often because of this undersampled and uh, um, nature, we require some additional regularization parameters, which are described here in the later part. And these bring prior knowledge into our system, which allows us then for stable solution. Examples here are the classical L2 prior, but we also have L1 prior, or we can bring in a wavelength transform to enforce positive, for instance. So in practice, both direct and iterative methods are applied. And in this talk and in general, we focus more on the iterative methods because um, they um, are well suited for tomographic imaging. They in particular only require two major operations, with, which is the matrix vector multiplication S times X and the matrix vector multiplication S adjoint times Y. And you only need these two operations. And in case you can carry out these in a matrix free fashion, you um, of course then can, yeah, actually um, perform reconstruction without actually loading the system matrix into main memory. In addition, these transformations often have a fast uh, implementation. For instance, if S is a fast Fourier transform or Fourier matrix, then we can apply the fast Fourier tra transform and which requires just n log n instead of n squared. Examples here are in computer tomography, S is the radiant transform. In magnetic resonance imaging, S is the Fourier transform, although in practice it's a little bit more complicated. We have additional terms and also I have a non-equidistant sampling pattern in Fourier space. In the magnetic particle imaging, MPI is a dense matrix, but it can be sparsified under a certain um, transformation. And the main point here is, if you look at this, um, from a computer science point of view, you can see that there is potential for sharing a lot of common infrastructure. So, but before we come to Julia, we actually want to have a look at what state of the art in these computing platforms for tomography. And we look at different use cases. First of all, we have the algorithmic researchers which usually, usually use a high level language such as MATLAB and Python um, in order to show that their new algorithm performs better. Since these algorithms are often quite computation intensive, um, the algorithmic researcher uses um, selected, often downsampled sample problem sizes to cope for a slower computing environment. On the other hand, we have the application near researcher. These are researchers that really want to apply the algorithms to actual data to prove some, some clinical um, yeah, point here. These um, use usually a low level language such as C, C++ to run the algorithm really on the, on the true scale. And these um, frameworks are often developed by computer scientists who are working in the field and thus have some knowledge on these specialized um, programming languages. This is actually uh, where I come from. And if you combine this, of course, you end up with what we call the hybrid platforms. These are platforms where you have a fast in core written in C, C++ with bindings to MATLAB and Python. And this, of course, leads to what we call in Julia the two language solutions. Examples here are, I picked up two. One is Gatstron and the other is Bard. Both are very popular li libraries in magnetic resonance imaging, where there's a large community around um, yeah, these libraries. So when we want to focus a little bit more on these hybrid image reconstruction problems and want to identify some issues with them. So first of, one, of all, they are often tailored to exactly one imaging method. And this is because the um, communities are often splitted and thus one focus on the imaging, uh, on, on the modality one is actually researching. Second, these solutions often pull in many and dependencies for general purpose signal and imaging processing, for instance, convolution and so, and this is because they want to give the user a convenient um, platform. Then um, often these, um, plat uh, these um, software solutions have some kind of pipeline architecture, which means that since C++ is so static, they allow for some dynamic subsystem where you can um, take several smaller parts and plug them together using a certain scripting language. You, we know all this from, 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 for instance, gaming engines. This is a similar concept. 
On the other hand, if we look at BART, we can see that they use another approach where you have command line pro programs with many parameters, very flexible, and you can call them from Python MATLAB. Also a very, very good um, solution. And I really need to say this here because both of these are really exceptional good libraries and they really work very, very well if you are a user of the library. However, what I also need to um, mention here is that if you want to extend the libraries, then of course you need export knowledge because it is not sufficient that you can program in Python MATLAB, but you really need to understand all the core in, which can be written in a templated C++ code, which yeah, many people do, do not have. And this of course now brings us to Julia and the question is how do we want to tackle the problems um, that these hybrid solutions suffer? And here I want to first state all the design goals that I had when we developed these platforms. First of all, we wanted to buy the package family for image reconstruction and also acquisition. Um, and the most important point is that this will be a family and not just a single monolithic package. Second and very important point is that we want to reuse as many Julia packages as possible. This was really an important design goal. I did only wanted to implement imaging specific parts when necessary. Whenever there is a Julia package that we can reuse, that's perfect. If we have functionality that belongs to multiple imaging methods, we wanted to put that in shared packages so that we can reuse this for different imaging modalities. And yeah, these um, imaging specific or imaging modality specific libraries then are really just small libraries which only call yeah the, the shared infrastructure that we implemented in the other packages. Another design goal that we had is we wanted to make everything very hackable. This means we wanted to not allow a high level access, but also want to have a middle level access and a low level access. This is of course quite convenient for researchers that want to extend the libraries. And this brings us actually to our unofficial goals because um, we are a research group and um, effectively what I you know, wanted to create is something which provides me and my PhD students a platform where we can really focus on doing algorithmic research and do not just need to um, yeah, program a lot, but we can really have a strong platform that we um, can use for research. And what's also important to note is that we wanted to make research sustainable, because if you look at these things on a longer time scale, for instance, 10 years, and um, then it's, it's really good if you um, develop some new algorithm, if you put it in such a package and can reuse this in this in a later project, this uh, allows to make everything much more sustainable. So what do, did we actually need to reuse? If you think about the tom tomographic imaging uh, scanner, the first thing that you get is some raw data and you need to load it. And what we use here is hdf5.jl lightxml. If you have performed reconstruction, you need to store it. And for that purpose, there are different formats, for instance, DICOM and Nifty, where there are actually packages for it. Then we need the actual transformations. Uh, linear operators is a very nice package that allows us to express any transformation in the form that you can kind of use it um, as a as a matrix um, and get many operations for free. Then we use FFTW, NFFT and wavelets for different transformations that we require. For image and signal processing, we have the great images.jl package family. There's also the great interpolations.jl, which we simply can use and they simply work great. We also look a little bit into visualization. I will talk about this later where we use GDK, Winston and um, yeah, the Android Colors package family. And in addition to that, that we of course benefit a lot from Julia base infrastructure where we have multi-dimensional arrays, sparse arrays, and this is really great that all this is just there and we can focus on the things um, that are related to imaging. So we actually needed to um, write some additional packages First of all, um, we wanted to have some more advanced um, colorization and uh, image processing method. In, in particular, we often want to slice tensors in a very specific way. And for this reason, we developed image utils. Then we have sparsity operators, which basically takes linear operators and um, implements several imaging um, yeah, operators that we use. For instance, we have implemented an FFT operator, an NFFT operator, a wavelet operator, and so on. So this is all put into sparsity operators of JL. 
And then finally, what's what very important is, of course, the linear system solver. And we here developed our own package called regularized least squares, um, where we um, focused on iterative solvers um, with a flexible regularization approach. And actually, we also have some imaging specific corner cases why we, at this point, use a dedicated package. So I actually want to highlight one of the core points here of regularized least squares that we use. In regularized least squares, as, the, um, um, as indicated, these are iterative um, solvers, and thus they, in the inner, have some iterate method where we implement the iteration protocol, kind of. And this is one iteration, and in the core, every of these, uh, each of these solver at some point um, has the solution vector C or uh, a current estimate of it in, in iteration var variable. Then we multiply from the left the imaging operator and afterwards we apply from the left the adjoint imaging operator. And these here can be done in a matrix free fashion. And if you look at this and use this for one imaging um, method where S is for instance Fourier transform, then um, you simply just need to plug in here uh, the operator that implements the Fourier transform. And what you uh, directly see here is that this is generic code. And if you want to adapt this to a new imaging modality, you just need, need to uh, implement a new operator and the associ associated operations, of course. So if we bring all this together, this is the picture like it is uh, today. So we have here two the, uh, imaging modalities that we investigate, magnetic, magnetic particle imaging and magnetic resonance imaging. Then we have here our Julia package family with the known packages, the reused, our new shared packages, and then really these tiny packages where we try to only put the images, the, the modality specific parts in. And finally, you end up with some nice reconstruction and can, can use that. And now I want to go into a little bit more detail in MRI, MRI RECO. So MRI RECO is for magnetic resonance imaging. And um, yeah, what we implemented, we implemented some file formats, for instance, the ISMMRD or the Bruker file format. Then we implemented different trajectories, the operators. We developed a simulation framework and, of course, a reconstruction framework. For details, I refer to this publication that we recent, re recently published in MRM. So and if you look on the right, you can see that it all starts with reading raw data from file. Then we load this into something which is called an acquisition data object. So you can see that we here develop special types that represent the data, um, for instance, also the sampling trajectory. And then we can pass this to the reconstruction method, which in addition gets a parameter dictionary, which allows to customize the reconstruction, select reconstruction parameters, and so on. The end result will then be stored in an image or an access array, actually, which also contains uh, yeah, the, the lengths and so on in the access. Finally, you can store this in Diacom and Nifty. And here is an example now of MRI Riku in action. On the left, you can see that we created Chap Logan Phantom X, two dimensional image. Then we perform a simulation. And here you can see that we use for flexibility a dictionary where you can select or choose different parameters. And finally, we just call simulation of X and params. This results in acquisition data object. This acquisition data object is now in the next step passed to the reconstruction function, which in addition gets as well a parameter dictionary where we can adjust all these regularization um, approaches. And finally, you get your reconstructed image. What's of course interesting for us was how do we actually compare to existing solutions? So is our performance comparable? And the answer is yes. So we compared ourselves in a micro benchmark called sense reconstruction with BART. And here I need to note that both BART and MRI RECO, you are multi-threaded. So we use here the parallel task runtime from Julia, and you can see quite nicely that both libraries scale nicely with the number of thread, threads. Additionally, you can see that MRI RECO um, is in parts even faster than BART. Just for high thread numbers, we are a little bit slower. And this was a proof for us that we can, in pure Julia, write something, something which is comparable to C++, C++ but it's, it's uh, much easier to write algorithms in it. What was also interesting was the question, how do these libraries um, compare when it comes to the um, accuracy? And I need to note here that these two libraries um, um, implement the same algorithm, but of course, this um, is some kind of a clean room implementation with a lot of implementation um, specific behavior. And thus we have a small difference, but if you look at the images, these really look very similar. 
This brings us now to the second imaging modality that we're developing, with which, which is magnetic particle imaging. You can see here in color coding the inflow of a bolus into a mouse heart, where you can see the fast dynamics that magnetic particle imaging provides. MPI is a tracer-based imaging method, and yeah, it's particularly well suited for vascular imaging and imaging in organ perfusion. We developed a package family consisting of MPI files, MPI repo, and MPI measurements. And what you can see here is some code. You can see here that we provide a reconstruction function on different levels. Levels, For instance, here we have a level that operates on dictionary and um, uses a data store where all the file handling is automatically performed. Then we have a middle file uh, abstraction layer where we are operating on actual files here. And finally, we have the low level access where from the files we have loaded the matrices, the measurements and really operate on these areas. And this shows also quite nicely um, how powerful multiple dispatch is for here having the same function but operating on different levels. And of course, all these functions call each other. So you really can have a chain of function that is used here. And this is actually the um, magnetic particle imaging device that uh, we have um, in, um, in Hamburg. And when this was um, um, installed in 2014 by the commercial vendor Brooker, it actually um, had real-time acquisition, but it had no real-time reconstruction um, pipeline. And we thus asked the question, is it possible to actually sniff the raw data stream and directly reconstruct the data? And if we do this, can we do this with Julia, of course? And this is what we then did. Here you can see the MPI scanner that stores all the raw data in a, in a streaming fashion to a file. What we then did is we, we sniffed this file and directly took the last frames, averaged them, reconstruct them and have an on-day display that chooses. And this is um, how this looks in practice. You can see here that I put two um, of these dots, so it's a two dot phantom. I now put this into the MPI scanner and now insert it into the scanner bore. And what you here already can see is the online reconstruction pipeline that has is rendering three orthogonal slices through the 3D tomographic imaging object. And here you can see quite nicely the two dots that we actually put it in there. The other example I want to highlight here is a little bit more sophisticated. So in practice, if we have very fast motion, we um, are, have motion artifacts if we don't take the motion into, uh, into account. And what we then need to do is we need to reconstruct an object C of R and T. So we really need to um, bring the temporal nature of the signal here into account. And um, if you look at the imaging, equation that we then need to consider, you can see here the term C of RT. In, in order to reconstruct such dynamic data, one um, uses um, a reconstruction approach where one um, requires small data snippets and is, assumes some periodicity of the data. And with that, we can fill and enter a raw data space and in the, in the end reconstruct uh, an image successfully, which is shown on the right. In the upper left, you can see a static phantom which consists of several dots, which look just fine. Then if we rotate this phantom and don't um, just average all the data, you can see that we have all these smearing artifacts. So we just have lost all the, the temporal resolution. If we try um, to ignore this t um, movement, we end up with completely inconsistent data, which is shown on the lower left. And if we apply our motion um, aware reconstruction algorithm shown on the lower right, you can see that we are capable of um, correcting all these effects. And why am I showing you this? Because this shows that if you have a good reconstruction library, it's possible to actually provide new algorithms, new research stuff, and integrate this into the existing um, infrastructure. And this really requires an image reconstruction framework, which is very, very flexible in usage. So, and finally, I want to um, touch a topic, which is the graphical user, user interfaces. So the question is, why do we need GUIs at all? And there's actually two reasons. First of all, if we want to give our programs to um, non-programmers, -program, program, for instance, medical researchers, they, of course, uh, want to have such, such a user interface. And also, if we do data exploration, parameter tuning, this is very handy and actually makes us more effective. From the technology point of view, we use gtk.jl for the widgets, kyo.jl for drawing, colors.jl for all the image fusion stuff you can see here on the right, and winston.jl for plotting. In this short video, you can see our GUI in action. So you can see I start here, 
Then I select a study we want to reconstruct. I now select the measurement and look at the raw data in Fourier space, where you can also now select smaller bands of the raw data or select channels. Then we go into the reconstruction platform and I perform an initial reconstruction, which is quite noisy, but you can already see two kidneys within our kidney phantom, which is also shown here. And what I now do is I change the Tukhanov regularization parameter, perform an additional reconstruction. Now you can quite nicely see that the reconstruction result um, matches our phantom that we used here. You can see here that I can also change the windowing parameter. I can change the color map. And since we are um, having here a three-dimensional image, I can also do um, projections, which is shown here with a spatial uh, MIP. And finally, if I'm satisfied with a certain reconstruction set, I can simply save it and store it into another data file. And this brings us now to the summary and outlook. So I hope that I convinced you that Julia is very, very well suited for implementing an enter infrastructure for tomographic image reconstruction. And I'm in particular um, convinced that the fancy Picagee manager allows us to make uh, this modularization so nice and there's really no excuse to reinvent um, yeah, monolithic packages, but it's better, better to really have smaller packages and share infrastructure. And the adaption of our packages in MPI is a little bit slower because we have many people which still stick to MATLAB, but in MRI we actually have uh, various researchers uh, that already use MRI RICO. Some outlook, I really think we need to, um, um, com uh, to uh, bring um, the regular SD square in, in more, reuse more of the iterative solvers and pro proxy mapping infrastructure that is already there in other packages. I think about upstream parts of imaging utils. And then and there's, of course, we need more parallelism. We, we need more tomographic imaging methods. And um, also I think that machine learning is a very hot topic in this field. And there we want to look more into the integration of Winston's flux.jl. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Bye.